I love bourbon, but I'm not ready to restart my career and be a distiller. I have a bachelor's degree and I want to continue to use those skills in the whiskey industry. So check this out. The University of Louisville has an online distilled spirits business certificate. And this focuses on the business side of the spirits industry, like finance, marketing, and operations. This is perfect for anyone looking for more professional development. And if you ever want to get your MBA, their certificate credits transfer into UofL's online MBA program as elective hours. Learn more about this online six-course certificate at uofl.me slash bourbon pursuit. Uh, you know, you have a whole line of beers and a whole line of wines. And then, of course, I'll, br- I'll bring a lot of different whiskeys and uh, we-, we have a good time on, on the uh, on the holidays. Yes, Most families say. have like a chili cook off. <laughs> you all have like a booze off. Like <laughs> mine's way better than what you're making. <laughs> Hey everyone, it is episode 244 of Bourbon Pursuit. I'm Kenny, one of the hosts. And last week, somebody asked me, why didn't I talk about the announcement of Blanton's Gold coming to the U.S. on the podcast opening? They're right, I totally should have. It was a huge miss because it was massive news. So yes, that is happening. And this will also be one of the major talking points for next week's Bourbon Community Roundtable. So make sure you tune in for that because it's likely going to be 100% all about Blanton's. All right, on to the news. Diageo is raising a glass to the women behind some of their most famous labels with the introduction of their Crafts Women project. The two new whiskeys are going to be one as Bullet Blender Select, crafted by Bullet Blender Ebony Major and Jane Walker, created by Johnny Walker's master blender, Emma Walker. Both will be hitting the shelves this spring. Bullet Blender Select number 001 will be a blend of three of the distillery's 10 high rye bourbon recipes bottled at 100 proof. Diageo also announced the release of Jane Walker Scotch, a 10-year blend featuring whiskey from Speyside. Jane Walker is crafted by Emma Walker, who has the lion's share in most run of inventory with over 10 million casks of aging and maturing whiskey in distilleries across Scotland. Bullet Blender Select and Jane Walker will be hitting shelves in the coming months for a suggested retail price of around $50 and $38 respectively. Pinhook Bourbon has announced the arrival of their 2020 Bohemian Bourbon the first bourbon release in almost 40 years that was distilled at historic Castle and Key. Pinhook Contract distilled the new bourbon at Castle and Key, which is also once known as Old Taylor, to craft their own custom mash bill of 75% corn, 10% rye, and 15% malted barley. They blended just 100 barrels of this 34-month bourbon to create their high-proof release, which clocks in at 114.5. It will share some of the same magenta wax color as last year's cast strength bourbon expression, the High Proof Bohemian Bourbon will be arriving on shelves in April of 2020 for a suggested retail price of around $50. In Bourbon Pursuit news, since the beginning of 2020, we have already selected seven barrels from places like Buffalo Trace, 1792, and Four Roses, while we have eight more barrel selections to go in just the first half of this calendar year to alone. And we've got places like New Riff, Jack Daniels, Bullet, Heaven Hill, and more. So if you want to be a part of this, head on over to patreon.com slash bourbon pursuit. And not only can you help support the show, but you get some damn good bourbon in the process. And in more bourbon pursuit news, you know that you can find us on every podcast platform out there, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Google, and even places like YouTube. But now we're hitting the airwaves. Yes, airing on Wednesdays from 9 to 10 a.m. We will be in Bardstown, Kentucky's radio station, WBRT with frequencies of 1320 AM, 97.1 FM, 94.9 FM, and online at WBRTCountry.com. The first show is set to launch next week on March 18th of 2020. Now today on the podcast, we dig into a brand that we know about, but don't really know about. And that's A. Smith Bowman, which is owned by Sazerac and based out of Fredericksburg, Virginia. We sit down with their master distiller, Brian Pruitt, to learn more about the inner workings of their operations and how the relationship with Sazerac and Buffalo Trace works as it pertains to the bourbon. With more than 20 years of brewing and distilling expertise, he tells us how they dialed in their stills and is pushing out a unique product. We also talk about their capacity and what the future entails for growth as well. Plus, we may or may not talk about gin for a few minutes. All right, 
Also, as a small apology, this podcast audio for this week was recorded over Zoom and is the final podcast to air using this platform. All shows going forward are using new platforms that will enhance your listener experience. So thanks for sticking with us. It's time for the show. Here's Joe from Barrel Bourbon. And then you've got Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Joe Beatrice, founder of Barrel Craft Spirits. We explore whiskey in an entirely new way. My team at Barrel Craft Spirits selects and blends barrels of whiskey into something greater than the sum of their parts. Use the store locator at BarrelBourbon.com. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. As I put the whiskey to my lips, I felt a tingle just throughout my palate. It started on the front and moved its way toward the back, just dripping down the jawline, tickling the top. And it's going to surprise you where this whiskey came from. It was not from Kentucky, Tennessee, or Indiana. This barrel-proof bourbon was distilled, aged, and bottled in Texas. That's right, Texas. Texas is on the move, and they have been for some time. And I do believe that Texas bourbon will soon begin to rival Kentucky in competitions and with consumers from California to New York and from Alaska to Hawaii. Now, this bourbon that I tasted that kind of wowed me was TX Texas Straight Bourbon Whiskey. It was 127.4 proof, four years old, barrel proof is on the label, obviously. And it's from Firestone and Robertson. I tasted this on my YouTube channel. If you haven't, go check that out. It's for my What's in the Box segment where I open a box and taste whatever's in the box. But this this bourbon really was one that kind of um, made me think, rethink my position on where Texas is. Now, I've always thought Texas is a growing state and very powerful when it comes to whiskey. And I think the rise of Texas has been, has been happening for some time. But in the last couple years, we have seen Texas distillers like Iron Root win major awards. We've seen Balconies kind of like, um, you know, get on shelves all over, all over the country and win uh, pallets, especially those in the American single malt category. While Garrison Brothers has kind of dominated like this, like this landscape and built a cult following for itself. I think right now, Texas is prime to do things in American whiskey that we've not seen any other state be able to do. And there's a good chance as I go off to San Francisco to judge the World Spirits Awards that we could see a Texas whiskey win a lot of gold. I'll say this, Texas has the formula. They have the formula to be able to compete with all the great distillers around the world. They have a consumer base that really is passionate about anything from Texas. I mean, hell, you could, you could slap made in Texas on anything and it would sell out in Texas. Those people love their state. And they have a lot of talent and they have the education there. Like people from that state uh, who are in the distilling business have taken the time to go get the education that it requires to be good distillers. They're also humble. You don't see them slapping master distiller on their, or for the most part, you don't see them calling themselves master distillers without, in their opinion, earning it. And I also don't think that you see a lot of like terribly bad products coming out of Texas. The one thing that's going to hold Texas back is its water. Water, it has, it, it's, it's, it's not a resource in abundance in Texas. And this is something that I think that every whiskey state needs to be able to rely on. You need to rely on uh, a lot of water, obviously. But keep your eye on Texas. Something's going on there. And if you, if you haven't tasted this yet, make sure you go pick up a bottle of that TX Barrel Proof Bourbon. And if you followed me for a while, you know how hard it is for me to give a compliment from te- to Texas. After all, I was born and raised in Oklahoma, where... We kind of rival Texas in a lot of ways. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you have an idea for Above the Char, hit me up on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. Just search for my name, Fred Minnick. Again, that's Fred Minnick, M-I-N-N-I-C-K. Or go to my website, fredminnick.com. Until next week, cheers. Welcome back to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny and Ryan here today talking to uh, another master distiller we have never had on the show today, but it is coming from a distillery. I've got one or two bottles downstairs. 
Uh, love what they're doing. Really good things over there. But it is, uh, it's not in Kentucky's backyard, which is a little bit different for us from time to time. Yeah, typically, well, I'm, I'm surprised. This is like one of the master stillers we haven't had on, so I'm excited. Like mm. uh, we haven't had him on yet. I don't know what's taking so long. <laughs> it's probably my fault. But, uh, uh, no, we just got to, but just got to knock on the right door sometimes. But they do have a great product. I, I don't know a ton about it, so I'm really excited to kind of get their story and info. But I had some great uh, single barrel picks from them from Liquor Barn around here. So uh, I know they're doing some good stuff, and uh, excited to see what the future and past, present all the above for this uh, distillery. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of going to be a culmination of all those things because what we've seen, at least around here in Kentucky, is being able to finally get your hands on some of these bottles. And now that, and it's got a unique bottle shape too. It's kind of mm -hmm. like this this oval looking heart shape kind of thing. And it's, it's really cool. It really stands out on the shelf. And I think it's going to be good for our listeners to kind of learn more about the brand, more about the people that are behind the brand as well, because I think that's Again, what our audience really cares about. They want to know more about the stories of the people behind it. So, Yep. So let's stop talking and let's start asking. <laughs> let's kick it off. <laughs> so today on the show, we have Brian Pruitt. Brian is the master distiller at A. Smith Bowman out of Virginia. So Brian, welcome to the show. Well, Kenny, Ryan, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. It's great Absolutely. to talk to you guys today. So before we kind of dive into the history of Bowman and more about you know you, we always like to kick off the show and kind of think of like, what is it that got you into bourbon whiskey? Was there a uh, early, was there an early mm -hmm. like? I mean, and, and it's okay because we talk to a lot of people and they're all like, "Well, it started back when I was twelve, and Grandpa said, you know, <laughs> take a nip of this." So, kind of talk about your your first run in experience. Absolutely. So, you know, for me, it was a little bit different. I um, I started actually in school. I, I had no intentions of going into the alcohol the beverage industry. I, I was in actually pre pre med. And I had no, you know, I was in a class literally looking for nerves or whatever it was on a cadaver. And I thought, this sucks. I hate this. I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> nerves uh, on a cadaver, huh? <laughs> yeah, it was not fun. And uh, I decided, hey, you know what? I really like, I really like beer. Why, why don't I try to make beer? So I actually called up the a local brewery, which happened to be a large Anheuser-Busch. And I was able to talk to the, the master brewer. You know, here I am, this college kid. And he said, yeah, come on down. I'll talk to you. I'll tell you how I got to where I was. And, and I went in and talked to him. And, and he said, yeah, this is what I did. And this is the path I took. And so I next day went in and uh, changed my major to uh, food science and uh, did the whole food science thing, at Colorado State, and then uh, eventually went on to do the master brewers at uh, UC Davis. Um, and started in the brewing industry. So I was working a lot of small craft breweries across uh, Colorado and California. And, uh, you know, after several years in the brewing industry, I decided I wanted to learn what beer became when it grew up. You know? when it come. <laughs> See, that's, that's the fun part, though. You always got to start with beer before you make to the, get to the spirits anyway. Absolutely. A lot of people don't realize, you know, basically what we do here is, is you know, for whiskeys, is you, is you, is you make a beer and then you're going to distill it after it ferments. So I kind of really wanted to, to learn about that. Uh, so I, uh, I, I found uh, at the time, I, I found a uh, weaseled my way into the, the wine industry, which had a very large uh, distillery with it and uh, was able to learn about, uh, you know, under a master distiller and a master blender uh, that had probably a combined about 80 years worth of knowledge. And I worked for them for well over a decade and, uh, you know, got to make all sorts of things, got to make um, brandies and vodkas and gins and spend time in Mexico making tequila and Caribbean rums and, and of course whiskeys and um, but eventually I, I really wanted to get back to kind of my roots which was uh, small craft um, you know high quality spirits and that's what brought me to A. Smith Bowman so mm -hmm. it's kind of a it may be a different route than some have taken uh, versus you know just like yeah my, my, my father worked in the industry and I got in the industry and you know, it's um, I, I will say that all of my family is involved with the alcoholic beverage industry. My brother works for breweries. My dad owns a winery and I'm in booze. My sister is the only one that hasn't made it. Uh, she's a doctor. So, um, you know, yeah, you got it. she liked the nerves on the cadaver. It's a trail. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So it sounds like you've worked with a lot of spirits. Uh, I know you're probably going to say you want to work or whiskey is your favorite thing to work with. But what's been one of your favorite uh, spirits to work with? 
I, I absolutely love whiskey. And I mean, it, it came from, you know, the, the brewing side and just seeing what you can do with the grain, the grain bill, different yeasts, um, and then taking that on and the maturation side. Um, I think that's, I think that's great. Now, I don't discriminate against the spirits, though. I, I love them all. I love all sorts of spirits. You know, in the in the summer, sometimes it's nice to have a nice gin and tonic. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, you need a, a nice brandy or rum drink when you you know you're out on you have to have a boat drink. You know, out out on the boat, got to have that rum drink. Uh, but of course, you know, nothing nothing beats a nice nice single barrel bourbon. So. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. See, when I go in the boat, it's like it's the only time I let it slide is like you get the Bud Light limes or you <laughs> yeah. get one of those kind of like the very fruity kind of forward kind of beers. It's the only time it works is when you're on a boat. Well, it takes plenty of beer to make to make good bourbon. So <laughs> absolutely. We'll let it slide. <laughs> well, cool. So that's good to see. Like, it, so was there I kind of want to talk about your family life here a little bit. So you talked about your family all kind of being in the, the alcohol beverage industry. Was there a you know, at least from your, your, your parents' side of it, was there an influence that said like, Hey, like this is a, this is a good route for you to go. Was that a, an opportunity that you said, yeah, I already kind of have experience in this yeah. because my family was a part of it. Like, was that uh, an influential factor into it? No, I think it was more, you know, actually my father, he, he kind of started the winery that he, he owns. Uh, he started it in that in retirement. So that's kind of like his retirement type thing. So it was all of us were kind of getting in the industry at all at the same time. And we all just kind of, I think we, we love the science aspect of it. We love the art aspect of it. Um, you know, we just kind of all went different ways. And um, it was just one of those things that, yeah, we get we get together and we have some pretty crazy uh, uh, Christmases and things like that where you can, you know, you really get to bring out the full spread of uh, a different, uh, I'll, I'll call it tipples. Uh, you know, you have a whole line of beers and a whole line of wines. And then, of course, I'll, I'll bring a lot of different whiskeys and uh, we, we have a good time on, on, the, uh, on the holidays. Yes, Most families say. have like a chili cook off. You all have like a booze off. <laughs> like it's, mine's way better than what you're making. <laughs> so it's, uh, it, it's, it was kind of interesting, but yeah, we, I mean, we definitely help each other out. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get calls from guys all the time. They'll say, Hey, I talked to your brother the other day and I think, you know, don't, don't believe a word he said, uh, or, Hey, I was at your dad's place. I uh, don't believe a word he said. He doesn't know what he's talking about. So you know, mm-hmm. we give, give each other a hard time. Well, that's okay. I mean, it's family. You have to give each other a hard time, uh, especially in the holidays. That's kind of oh, like yeah. I kind of like the booze off. We should probably we should make a bourbon pursuit booze off for our Christmas <laughs> holiday party. <laughs> it wouldn't last long. My family that like every time I bring straight bourbon or neat, they're like, I can't believe you drink this. This is oh, <laughs> this is awful. <laughs> so let's you know before we start talking more about your job and everything like that that you've gone with, let's let's give a, a our listeners kind of a an understanding and background of really what's the history at a Smith Bowman, because I just realized before we were coming on here, that is, it is not Abraham. It is actually Abram Smith. Bowman. Yeah, so kind of, yep. We're the experts. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. So school <laughs> us. So, so a Smith Bowman is actually uh, one of the oldest distilleries on the East coast. It was the oldest distillery in Virginia uh, started by Abram Smith Bowman. And a lot of his family actually um, kind of has roots to the, you know, the pioneers of, of basically during the Revolutionary War, discovering what is now current day Kentucky. So if you're in Louisville and you go out to Bowman Field, uh, that is actually part of the Bowman, what was discovered and named after one of the Bowman family. Uh, oh, really? Hmm. Centaurs of, of, of uh, Cedar Creek is what, as they were known. And all of our current day products are all named after the Bowman, like historical Bowman figures. Uh, but kind of getting to modern history of you know how Abram started it, he was actually the great grandson of of uh, Abraham Bowman, or sorry, George Bowman, and um, he was actually in the distilling industry prior to Prohibition. He he ran a distillery in in New Orleans prior to Prohibition, one of the largest rum and bourbon distilleries, Algiers Point, and uh, and then after you know, prohibition. He he happened to buy about seventy four hundred acres, and uh, he opened up a granary, and uh, <clears throat> and and cattle. And uh, then he, you know, of course, prohibition ends in thirty three. Uh, thirty four is when it ended here in in Virginia. And he decided, hey, you know, I already know this business quite well. I have I have all my own corn. I have all my own rye. Let's start making bourbon. And, uh, you know, and that's what he started doing. So right in 34, 35, he started making bourbon. 
Um, and his goal was basically straight, you know, grain to glass. We did everything from, like I said, growing the grain. Uh, we harvested our own trees and made our own barrels. I mean, we did it all. And the, the, the whole point was to make, you know, high quality spirits. And, uh, you know, we kind of continue on to with that, uh, that kind of mantra today. We're, we're known for making bourbons, of course, but we do other spirits as well. So that's, that's kind of a little bit of the history of it. We give a, we give a complete history. If you ever make it down to Virginia, we'll give you a complete history. <laughs> there we go. We'll, we'll, we'll do the, the 30 minute tutorial yeah. one of these days. <clears throat> that sounds good. Does it ever uh, make you all mad that like Kentucky gets all the glory for bourbon when Virginia was like the, the state before Kentucky? You're like, well, you know, we have a lot, there's, I, got, I will say a lot of people come in and they're very proud of their, their Kentucky bourbon heritage and, 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 uh, we're, we're proud of it as well, but, uh, we always like to remind them that Kentucky used to be part of Virginia and we say, exactly. well, we've been making bourbon here for a long time too. So it's kind of just curious about like the current operation, like kind of like the year that really it started or, or is it still like been all running since 18, whatever. Well, so we started, like I said, in, in 33 in Fairfax County, which is about just outside of the Washington, D.C. area. And uh, we moved it to their current location here in 1988. Uh, so we've been running here in this location since 88. And the reason we moved is because basically we sold off, the, the family sold off the farm. And uh, the, the city of Reston or that Fairfax County, which is well over a million people now, uh, just kind of grew around the distillery and they're, you know, having this distillery where literally uh, they were walking the cows in from the farm to feed off the slop down the middle of the road. Uh, they just didn't, they kind of didn't like that so much. So uh, moved to the distillery where, where we're at now, which is about 45 miles south of Washington, D.C. We're in the small town of Fredericksburg. Um, and it's, you know, it's been, it's been a great location for us. So we're right along the Rappahannock River and and, uh, you know, it's a great area for aging bourbons and, uh, we've enjoyed it here so far. Talk a little bit about like the, the history of the, the master distiller title there as well. Are you, uh, the, the fourth, the first of the, the new one, it, did they not have master distillers back no. then? Like, kind of talk about that. Yeah, actually. So th there's been six master distillers here in the history of the company since the thirties. Uh, the first one, uh, was for about five years and, uh, then we had, uh, uh, kind of one or two that only lasted about, um, you know, five to 10 years. And the previous master distiller, uh, was actually, or two master distillers ago was actually here for about 30 years. He kind of took it from basically took over as master distiller in the eighties until, uh, almost 2011. And then the previous master distiller to me was, uh, Truman Cox, who came from Buffalo Trace, actually. And he was here, um, I think he worked here for probably about three years, but he's only master distiller for a little over a year and a half. Uh, he sadly passed away uh, very, you know, very unexpectedly. And I took over from him. He had, he had been gone for probably about six months uh, when I took over. So I came into, uh, you know, into a building with, you know, there, there hadn't been a master distiller for six months. So it was one of those things where you, you, you hope that uh, the previous master distillers had taken notes and you go in and you learn the still and you find out what's going on and you taste through the stock. I know that's, that's rough to do. Got to taste through all the stock to find everything out. Somebody, uh, and thank you for, for taking that mm -hmm. sacrifice for us. We appreciate <laughs> uh, it. I'll, 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 that's okay. I'll, I'll do it again. I get it if I have to. So, uh, but it was, you know, it was just, trying to come in and find out what the house flavors were, uh, how the stills ran and, and just taking it from there. So I've been in this role for six years now. So how long, uh, how long do you think it takes to become comfortable with the uh, existing setup and to kind of get those, you know, like basic flavor profiles you're looking for dialed in? It takes a little while. It takes a, you know, I think you have a good um, couple of months that, you know, just tasting through all the stock, you know, just going through and seeing where everything is. So, you know, you're literally going out into the warehouse and you're saying, okay, you know, what's this one where, okay, this is a year old. What's it taste like? Okay. This is two years old. What's it taste like? And then all the way up, you know, 15, 16 years. And you're trying to find out, Hey, what are the flavor profiles uh, that are out there in the different parts of the warehouse? Cause you know, you, you don't have anybody to tell you that, you know, that historic, Hey, this is where I did this. And this is where I did this. And if I want this flavor, I pull out of this area of the warehouse. You just don't have that. So, um, you know, that, that took a little while, but you know, once, once you get there, I think, 
then it's tweaking it to make little little changes right off the bat just to just to kind of make it your own style and um and then kind of improve the product and that's one of the things that we always want to do is you know that's that's our logo or our motto here is pioneering spirit so we're embracing our history and just pushing the future we're just want to improve our products every day so we don't want to just sit back and go yeah that's okay it could be better. <laughs> so they, really they, they that's amazing. Free reign to make your own imprint on it. So it's not just like a plug and play, like this is the way we do it. Don't screw it up. Well, absolutely. I mean, there there is obviously you have an established brand and you don't want to, if you have uh, historic, you know, um, customers of that brand, you don't want to just change it willy nilly. Um, you know, you, you, if you're going to make changes, you want to make sure they're for the better. And, uh, you know, you want to keep improving them. but. Uh, you know, if it if it's a change that does make it better, makes it taste better, um, you know, improves its uh, its overall appeal, then yeah, absolutely, a free reign. Well, that's good because you know one thing that we always talk about is how the bourbon industry just loves to hear about change, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not really. Like it's 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 always like you know let's let's Kate let's stay the course. Let's not really not shake things up too much or anything like that. So I guess the question that I kind of want to pose about, you know, when you started coming in, you're figuring out like, how do we dial or how do we tweak things? Can you recall like one of those things that you kind of had to tweak to kind of figure out what it is to to kind of make through its own signature bourbon right yeah. now? Well, I mean, one of the things that I, you know, I, I'm looking for uh, as the heads were coming off the still and I, I walked in and I'm like, all right, well, wait, what are you doing? Oh, well, we're making the cut. I'm like, not yet. Not yet. You got to wait, 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 wait just a minute. Um, and then, you know, we, we do our heads cuts a little bit different and then eventually, you know, we're, we're saying, okay, where's our ideal proof? Um, because, you know, we had some periods of time that I will say that, you know, the proof really kind of varied, um, quite a bit off the still. And we tried to dial that in and tried to really get consistency off the, off the distillation process versus, you know, um, you know, just, Hey, this is the way that we run it every single time. Um, we wanted to go in and say, Hey, each, each tank, each fermenter, each batch is different. So we're going to adjust our still to make sure that our flavor profile is consistent from distillation to distillation so that you don't have this huge variation from batch to batch. You know, we wanted it, you know, there, there was, there was just processes that you have to go in and say, okay, this is, this is how we want to run it. And just a little tweak here, a little tweak there. And, you know, a lot of these guys have been working in the industry for, 30 years and they, they kind of go, Oh yeah. Okay. That makes sense. You know, they, these are, these are good things to do. So, um, I think we've been successful in that. So. Absolutely. And so I guess one of the things that maybe most people know about, um, is that it is all part of the, the Sazerac portfolio. So, uh, Buffalo trace, uh, all that sort of stuff is, is part, you know, Smith Bowman is part of that kind of, when did, when did that started happening, uh, when it became part of, of that portfolio? So it actually, it's, it's kind of an interesting story because uh, in the move for A. Smith Bowman from Fairfax to the current location, um, they had to take down all of the, basically the entire distillery shut it down for, it took about two years to move the entire distillery. Uh, so they started partnering with um, what was at that time before it was called Buffalo Trace was Ancient Age. Uh, so they started part partnering with them um, and doing the, the initial mash, gave them the, the yeast and the mash bill and things like that so that we could continue on producing. And uh, and then basically when, you know, we, we kind of kept going in that direction. And in 2003, uh, it was actually one of the first distilleries that Sazerac purchased uh, from the Bowman family. They purchased the distillery in 2003. And it's now it's even it's a, it's an even better situation because, yeah, we're able to, you know, we're all part of one one company and we can do all sorts of things uh, work together. It's a, it's a great network and we're all about, you know, making the ba absolute best products that we can, so, which is wonderful. What are some of the resources that I guess you you gain from being with Sazerac versus just trying to do stuff on your own? Or is it, big, well, is it like a big collaboration? I guess he's got Harlan's cell phone on speed yeah. dial. He's got that. Well, yeah, we we do have that, um, ob obviously, but uh, you know, the things some of the, the benefits are is, uh, you know, for example, barrels were really hard to come by a couple of years ago, right? Well, luckily, we buy enough barrels uh, that we're able to say, hey, you know, we're we're part of this bigger network, 
you know, can we, can we get barrels? Whereas if you're a, a small guy uh, and you're only buying, you know, a couple thousand barrels a year, you may not necessarily make the list for some of the big barrel producers. They say, well, you know, our big barrel producer or our big customers already have it. We don't have barrels for you. So tough luck, um, which has been a benefit, you know, getting, um, getting the distribution and sales and marketing side uh, of a larger company. Uh, I mean, th those just really work well. And, um, and it's a, it's a benefit for, for us, obviously, you know, because we, we do run ourselves as a, as a, a kind of a separate entity, a small, a small distillery. Uh, but we do have that, that lifeline, so to say, you know, to, to help us out. When we have a problem, uh, you know, Hey, uh, we don't have analysis for this kind of stuff. And can we send it to your lab and can you run it for us? And, and they'll say, yeah, absolutely. We can do that. And, um, you know, or, Hey, I, I have trouble getting this kind of grain or this kind of wood, um, you know, can, can somebody find it or, and, you know, and the, and the, the guys, uh, will, will help you out. So, which is, which is a great, uh, great thing to have. And so I think you, you kind of sparked a, an idea in my head too, because one thing that I think the bourbon community really thought of for the longest time is like, Oh, well, Smith Bowman, like all it is, is just sourcing from Buffalo trace. And it's not that at all. Um, you just said like, oh, we gave them the mash bill so they can start contract, basically contract distilling for us at the time. So kind of talk about really, is is that still part of the current operation? Are they still distilling for you or is everything shifted back over to uh, to well, your place? We do we do a combination of a couple of things. So we do use a, a, a mash bill um, that is made for us. Um, uh, and actually Buffalo it's not, it's not one, two or wheat, right? <laughs> well, you, come on. You guys, you guys know that, uh, we're, we're a little I bit, said we wouldn't be prodding for information. <laughs> you know, we're, we're a little tight lipped about some of our recipes sometimes. And, no, it's all good. Um, so it is, uh, it, what we do is we actually have them do the fermentation for us, uh, do a primary distillations for us and we'll get the high wines here. And then we'll finish up the distillation on a lot of our bourbon products. So distillation, aging, processing, bottling. Uh, but we also, uh, I mean, we have full mash and cook uh, capabilities here. So we'll do, you know, just yesterday, uh, we were using a, a local bloody butcher corn, uh, you know, a local rye and doing stuff on our, uh, our pilot still or our 500 gallon uh, experimental still. Um, so we have full capabilities here. Uh, we do a combination of both. Is everything aged there in Virginia yeah. or yeah. some aged yeah. in Frankfurt? So, okay. Yeah, we have all, all of the stuff that we're, we're putting out has been aged in our facilities. And so I, I, I mean, it's, uh, I think there was, it had to have been a few years ago now. There had been, there had been some pretty high aged releases that had come there of limited edition sort of stuff that came from your distillery. I think like in the rounds like 14 or 17 years old and stuff like that. Was that still your all's product as well, or kind of, kind of give a little bit of, well, you know, that. sometimes, sometimes we'll, we'll go out there and, and it depends on the product. Uh, most of the really old stuff uh, has been aging in our, in our, uh, our sellers for, for quite some time or our warehouses for quite some time. Uh, sometimes we'll, we'll find, uh, I'll call them unique barrels that we use for certain products and we'll bring them in and age them. Uh, and blend them. We're we're big on uh, on blending a lot of product here, so we like a, a little small batch. And sometimes when we do Abrahams, we'll do some. Uh, we'll find some very unique stuff that doesn't work. Um, but the majority of them have been almost primarily a hundred percent aged and and produced here. Great. So. I mean, I'm I'm already learning something, right? Because, like I said, from from a real whiskey geek background, most people kind of assume that oh, you know, part of the Sazerac portfolio, it's some of the stuff that's just could be the the Buffalo Trace, basically mash bill coming in. But no, it's good to understand that there is uh, there is this unique factor that is driving into it. And we had kind of touched about, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the the operation. Kind of talk about more along the lines of the size of what you're all able to do there. Uh, on your own, uh, and maybe even with combination of what's happening inside of Frankfurt with in regards of how many barrels you filling per day and so on and so forth. There are more craft distilleries popping up around the country now more than ever before. So how do you find the best stories and the best flavors? Well, Rackhouse Whiskey Club is a Whiskey of the Month Club, and they're on a mission to uncover the best flavors and stories that craft distilleries across the U.S. have to offer. 
Rackhouse's box ship out every two months to 39 states across the U.S. In Rackhouse's April box, they're featuring a distillery that mixes Seattle craft, Texas heritage, and Scottish know-how. Rackhouse Whiskey Club is shipping out two whiskeys from Two Bar Spirits located near downtown Seattle, including their straight bourbon. Go to rackhousewhiskeyclub.com to check it out and try some for yourself. Use code PURSUIT for $25 off your first box. How many barrels are you filling per day and so on and so forth? Well, and that's, that's unfortunately one of the few things that uh, the, they, they asked me not to speak about too much. Okay, uh, as far that's as fine. Our production, <laughs> our production size, but I, I will say what we do in a day is, uh, or even a year is what some of our sister distilleries can do in a day, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, 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 we find ourselves very, uh, very efficient, you know, are still, we're able to distill at almost 10 barrels an hour on our, our 2000 gallon pot still. So wow. we're moving pretty quick on that, but, and we can, we can barrel really quickly. You know, we can, we can empty a cistern tank in a matter of, you know, two to three hours. So we, we feel we're up there in, in terms of uh, all of our infrastructure is made for a large, large distillery. Uh, but in terms of our production, we're, we're what we would consider a micro distillery. You know, we're very small. All right. We'll okay. promise no more, no more poking and prodding on my, <laughs> don't do it. You talked about uh, Sazerac helping you all get in distribution into states. How many states are you currently available in? Well, currently we're, I think we're around 40 states. Um, okay. And we have distributed in the past to the UK. Uh, we do send some products to Japan as well. So it's, I mean, we're, we're out and about. Most of what we concentrate on though is, of course, Virginia, the East Coast. Uh, Kentucky is a big market for us. Uh, Indiana is also a good market for us. So, I mean, it's kind of, if, if you think, if you look at the map and you look at the, you know, kind of the South or, or Southeast states and uh, mid central states, it's really where we focus. Uh, but we do, I mean, of course we have distribution in, in California and we have some in Oregon and things like that. But uh, for the most part, it's, it's mostly in the East. So I kind of want to like shift a little bit and kind of talk about uh, back to kind of like the distillation, really like the flavor profile that you all are, are really trying to dial in on. You know, most people, I think Ryan brought it up in the very beginning, you know, Kentucky's very proud, very, very proud of their bourbon. Absolutely. And they should be. And, and so kind of talk about really what is, is, I mean, is there a, an overall flavor profile difference that is, uh, you know, coming from you all? Because you know, there's, there's, we always try to talk about, oh, limestone filtered water. It's so great here in Kentucky. <laughs> but most people, if you listen to the show enough, we're like, okay, it's reverse osmosis everywhere. We can kind of, we can kind of sit there yeah. and like put a checkbox. Like that's really nothing important nowadays. So kind of talk about uh, a different kind of flavor aspect that really you're trying to get with inside of your, your bourbon versus what you can get off the shelf of any other Joe Schmo Kentucky bourbon out there. What, what we look for is we look for a lot of like baked apple and cherry notes in the distillate. Uh, our yeast really kind of produces that that kind of note. So we and we want that to be emphasized in the in the raw spirit. Uh, the white dog coming off the still, um, and we want it really clean. We want that nice um, corn. You know, we want that sweet corn, a little bit of a hint of that rye coming through, uh, but we don't want it to be spicy. We want it to be really super smooth. Um, and then when we age it out, uh, of course, for the Bowman Brothers, I, I want a little more of the spirits come through, a little less of the barrel. So uh, a little bit of the vanilla, a little bit of the kind of the oak, the oak tannins to come through with the emphasis on the on the fruitiness. Uh, and then when we go the like, say, the John Jay, um, because it's a single barrel, we want it to we want the barrel to stand out a little bit more. So we want a little more of that coconut and, and uh, heavy caramel notes. Uh, we want, you know, that really toasty oak. And then in the background, we want that nice, smooth, you know, kind of baked apple note. Um, I think I sound more like a, a John Jay person. Cause you said, <laughs> you said coconut and you said like oak, like that's, oh man, you just, yeah. you, you pulled on my heartstrings right there. Whereas I like the fruity and the softer notes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sweet. So, and, 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 you know, people ask me which one's the best. And I say, well, I, you know, I, I, I don't decide between the two. And then we kind of do one in the middle which is, uh, you know, our, our port finish. So if you like a little bit sweeter notes, we, we add a little bit more oak to that one in terms of it gets a kind of a, 
basically, we're, we're doing a finish on, on port barrels, uh, ruby port barrels that we import from Portugal, and we also use Virginia port barrels. And uh, then we age it, or we finish it in a Solera process. So we always blend all the barrels together at the end, uh, French oak, American oak, and it's all in one big, huge um, oak tank at the end that we bought a lot of uh, to get that kind of extra character. It gets some really nice fruit notes and some really nice oak notes. So kind of the combination of the two. So if I'm taking my notes correctly, we got we got a, a, a Smith Bowman, we got John J Bowman, we've got the port finish. Is there any other products that that I, I'm not that we haven't talked about yet? Yeah. So so we have we have uh, as far as our bourbons, we have our Bowman Brothers bourbon, which is a small batch bourbon. We have the Isaac Bowman, which is a port finish. We have our John Jay, which is a single barrel. Uh, then we have our Abraham, which is our experiments. So those can vary in mash bill or finish or anything like that. Uh, then we, of course, do rum, gin, and a vodka. And you, you have to do a cream liqueur, of course, a bourbon bourbon caramel cream. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. Now, are, do those have the Bowman name to them as well with the, the gin and the vodkas? Uh, yeah, the gin is actually called uh, Sunset Hills. So it's, it's named after our original farm. And the vodka is called Deep Run, which is the name of the lake, which is right in front of the distillery. And uh, George Bowman is our rum. And it's a uh, Caribbean rum. And then Mary Height, who was the matriarch of the Bowman family, that's our that's our bourbon caramel cream. You didn't pull uh, Harlan Wheatley and name it uh, Brian Pruitt? We- no, 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 I, 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 I don't have that kind of pull, I guess. Um, you know, I don't think they, they would look at it and they'd probably pronounce it wrong or they go, I, I don't, I don't want that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> You're just humble. Uh, I try to be we, we, we have, we have, uh, you know, we really appreciate that people enjoy our brands and, and, uh, we hope that, uh, they enjoy what we're putting out. That's, I mean, that's the whole goal is that I, I go in day in, day out and put, uh, you know, I, I, I put my passion into what I'm doing and, and I hope they enjoy it. So I want to talk about Kenny will probably make him mad, but I want to talk about gin for a second. Make, just because talk, uh, talk about gin, gin, gin pursuit. Just because, uh, well, we, I've been going to a couple of distilleries and they happen to be producing gin that day, and so kind of you know putting in their different blends and their own botanicals, botanicals in it and stuff. So talk about your gin and what kind of makes it unique and what do you like about it. Well, we, and, and I kind of, I, d- I didn't even mention the fact that we actually have five gins out there right now. So we wow, do, we do a lot of gins. Yeah. We, uh, gin curious uh, now. Yeah. We, we have our sunset Hills, which is kind of a, I'll call it a straight London dry style, fairly, fairly simple in, in flavor profile, only about four different botanicals. Uh, but then we, we actually do a line called the Tinkerman's line. Uh, I'm the Tinkerman, I guess. Um, and we're, we're tinkering with different styles, different distillation methods. Uh, and then we have a citrus supreme. Uh, we have a spice, which we're, we're doing more of the brown spice characters. And we have a balance, which is called bright and complex. And then we actually made with local rye. Um, you know, we just not more than a half an hour from the distillery. We did a hundred percent rye base, rye gin. We called it rye expectations. We used rye as a botanical too. So, um, you know, we, we like to use that and, you know, that's one of the ways when, when we, uh, we don't have, we have some extra time on the still, it's really fun to get in there and, you know, you can, unlike bourbon where it takes, you know, seven, 10, 12, 15 years to really see your product, mm-hmm. you can turn around and, and come up with a recipe and the next day you can taste it. You're like, oh yeah, okay. That was fun. So how do you incorporate these botanicals? Do you like throw them in like a tea bag and throw them in there or like how to, how to, or do you just throw them straight in there? How do you extract these different flavors? Uh, it it kind of depends on the recipe, but we'll do uh, a lot of times we'll do um, kind of the maceration in the pot. So we'll throw all the botanicals in the pot, but certain botanicals, like uh, for example, if we're putting elderflower in there or, you know, um, you know, some of the, kind of the more floral aspects that we put into, um, into some of our gins, We'll actually put it in a gin basket, which is actually in the steam, uh, the vapor line uh, of our still. And so it's, it's vapor extracted. So we'll put certain things in like vanilla bean or elderflower or things like that, you know, that we don't want to just sit there and boil and cook them. Um, we want just the really nice top notes to come out. And so and depending on the on the method, we'll use we'll use, you know, sometimes a combination of the two. And uh, we can even sometimes do extractions and then distill it. So it's just kind of depends on the gin. 
could you do that with bourbon or whiskey any type like i guess not well because well, you have the 51 percent corn then say you want to get certain fruity flavors or certain vanilla vanillins could you technically extract them from in the I, well I, technically yes um whether or not it could be legally called whiskey is a different a different story but uh um yeah you could probably do that i, w- I wouldn't put it past that maybe something like that has happened <laughs> so there's the Pruitt. <laughs> That's the Pruitt product. Well, then he's then he's fighting a battle with the TTB of like, what do we even classify this thing? Yes. Yeah. yeah, everything gets good. Oh, then now it becomes a DSS. Mm-hmm. All right, off the gin tan. I was about to say, you got any more gin? <laughs> no, gin things going on. I just here? find it interesting because, like you said, you can distill it there and get the flavors right then and there versus having to wait. So I was always curious about it. Got to You got to have your vitamin G and vitamin T in the summer. So. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, one thing that we kind of talked about at the very top of the show, you know, Ryan said that, you know, the products that he tried were all single barrels. So kind of talk a little bit about the single barrel program that you do have there. Um, you know, I've, I've made, been made aware of it at, uh, at some point. We probably need to do our own single barrel there too. And we'll, we'll if we get out. invited. Yeah. Well, if we get invited, just let us come <laughs> out there. We'll, we'll choose a barrel. Yeah. Well, and we have, we, we, we kind of for a while because uh, the John Jay is really what we do is single barrels and it's, and it's a it's a well aged product. Um, it's anywhere from nine to fourteen years typically is what will age that product in a single barrel. What we like to do there is you know I've, anything that really kind of goes out in our normal uh, production runs. Uh, I want a specific flavor profile. I want that like I mentioned earlier, you know that vanilla and the coconut and and, um, and the high toasty notes. But sometimes you get some barrels that are really really good. Uh, but don't meet the flavor profile of uh, what you would want, expect on the shelf. So if you were to buy a John Jay uh, today and then a couple of weeks later go out and buy another one and they didn't taste the same or similar, you you might be a little bit upset. And you may have loved it before and, and you didn't love the next one. So what we do is, you know, barrels that are slightly different, barrels that maybe have a little more spice or maybe a little more fruit uh, or maybe a little more vanilla. Um, they're wonderful in their own right. Uh, we put those into, into a lot of our private barrel selections is when we do those. So that's why, you know, some people have a specific taste that they're looking for. They're looking for more of an earthy, spicy, some have more of a, you know, like I said, a sweeter profile. And those are the ones that we we've done in the past. And we've, we've been pretty, pretty tight on barrels just because of the, I mean, just purely on the amount of we, I don't think any of us expected the growth of, of single barrel bourbons uh, to take off like it has, and so we've been playing catch up. But uh, hopefully, we'll we'll have more and more of those barrels available in the future. But there's there has been some absolutely spectacular ones that have come out recently. You know, some ones that uh, you know I, I I put in my I call them my spice rack. You know, <laughs> if I if I have something that is really amazing, doesn't fit the profile of John Jay. Uh, but maybe potentially, you know, if I can use it for blending, uh, like I mentioned, blending into an Abraham, Abraham down the road, you know, Hey, I need a little more spice or I need a little more, uh, fruit. And then I'll take these out of the spice rack and occasionally they just sit up on the spice rack and I can't find a home for them. Uh, I let people taste them and if they like them, they can take them home. See, there's the sticker idea for, uh, the Bowman pick. The there spice you, rack. The spice rack. <laughs> so, so, are you familiar with single barrel stickers? How people are putting these gaudy, you know, stickers on the back? Oh their- yeah, absolutely. We 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 do those for for people. Absolutely. <laughs> what what would you do for a single barrel pick of, if, of your choice? Oh well, I I have a couple of barrels up there that are really amazing. Uh, I've been sitting for a while, and um, yeah, they're getting up there in proof. I should probably pull them pretty soon, but. Uh, uh, you know, it kind of depends on the day. Some days I like a little more, a little more spice in my uh, my bourbon, uh, and other times I, I I like a really soft, almost almost a weeded profile. So it it, it just kind of depends on the day. Yeah, well, I'm gonna go ahead and put in a request now uh, because if you go through and you find one that is like super coconut, it tastes like an almond joy. Just go ahead and earmark that one and be like, yeah, this right. hold on, let me, mark, let me mark this down right now. Yeah. Yes. As ahead. you're going through your sampling today. Yeah, sampling, put it on a post-it note and be like, all right, this is for the Bourbon Pursuit guys. We'll send you some stickers you can throw on there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Make sure they're really big and round and cover the whole back. 
We, uh, what, sure. what got you covered? Yeah, we'll do it. <laughs> that sounds great. We'll we'll even we'll send you our uh, our handwriting too, so you can just like trace it on the on the barrel head. <laughs> so we can just go ahead and claim it. So the um, you know, one of the things that we always like to kind of talk about is you know, you kind of talk about extra still time and kind of like what can we do, create some experimentations, do some crazy gins and stuff like that. But we look at really what's happening into the the bourbon market and the bourbon world. And one thing that you as a master distiller you have to do, you have to kind of look at the spreadsheet and start calculating like what is what is this bourbon market what is this boom going to look like in the next few years what's is there going to be a bust what's it going to look like where where do you kind of see the the market trending here uh in the next 3 years 5 years decade decade 3 years 5 years i think it's going to start slowing down a little bit um you know it's just been growing it's it's such fast pace i think it will slow down just a little bit but by that, I, I mean, instead of double digits growth, we're going to have high single digit growth and type of things. And, and I don't see it stopping. You know, I don't, I don't see a fall of whiskey um, and bourbon in particular in the near future. I think it'll just kind of flatten out for a while. You know, it, it's, we've had this huge spike. I think you're going to see, you know, the people will, you know, rye for a long time. No one wanted to drink a rye, and now all of a sudden, rye is popular again. So I think I'll see. We'll see a little bit of that come up. Uh, I think it's going to be healthy for the next few years, um, and probably the next five, ten years. I think it'll be pretty healthy. At least we're counting on it. Uh, we're putting down the stock for that. So um, I hope I hope it continues that way, and I hope I'm right. So. Otherwise, I got a lot of stock. I'm going to have to figure out what. It is. <laughs> well, we're in the bulk market. Yeah, you know, well, so. I mean, that is. We like to drink whiskey too. We'll be more than happy to help you. Just you know, go through and sample every barrel that's out there. Yeah. So talk about uh Virginia and how how they kind of embraced you guys, you know, and hung their hat on you as like this is our distillery. Do, do you kind of have that with uh, the state or? Uh, well, we, we do. There's, you know, it's, it's interesting. And the last, you know, up until the 50s, we were the, really the only distillery in Virginia. And now, you know, over the past five years, uh, just the distilling industry in Virginia has really taken off. Uh, we've gone from, you know, being 20 small distilleries in the state to now I think there's 70 in the state. Um, but I think a lot of people still embrace the fact that, you know, bourbon is one of the products and whiskey is one of the products, uh, that is made and has been made in Virginia for a long time. And there's a lot of people that, uh, really, really are, are putting out some great products. And, you know, and I, I think it's, it's great that a lot of people look to A. Smith Bowman and they go, oh yeah, okay. That's, you know, that's, that's the model of, that we should follow, uh, for making a great, uh, bourbon or a great whiskey in the state of Virginia. And I think a lot of people, you know, a lot of people who have lived in this area for a long time, they know us and they know our products. And, uh, you know, of course they go to their football games and they, they have their bottle of A. Smith Bowman and, and, uh, you know, that's, that's their tradition. You know, we, we, I have guys uh, that'll send me a, you know, Hey, I'm 80 something years old and I've been drinking A. Smith Bowman bourbon since, you know, I was 20. Uh, so, which is great to hear, you know, it's, it's one of those legacy products that, um, uh, you know, you just don't find the history in a lot of the smaller distilleries. And I think that's a wonderful thing to, to be a part of that history. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, you kind of, you kind of struck something in my head when you started talking about, oh, there's, it went from, you know, 20 now to 70. Do you see a lot of like competition coming through your doors and saying, oh, let's go see what, let's go see what Brian's up to over here. Let's see if we can take down a few, few notes in our, in our. Uh, uh, yeah, and, uh, absolutely. I, I, we had a lot of people that do that. We'll, we'll have, you know, the local distiller will say, Hey, can I come up and walk through the distillery and, and spend some time with you? And I say, absolutely. You can come walk through the distillery. We do tours every hour on the hour <laughs> and, you can, and we don't hide anything. And you can, you can see exactly what we're doing. Now we may not tell you exactly what we're doing. We may not tell you, you know, Hey, this is the mash bill. This is how we're doing this, but you can see what we're doing. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're very, you know, we're supportive. We want to, we really think that the industry has room to grow and we want to support them. Um, but we also, you know, I, I don't want the industry to go in such a way that people look out and they see the smaller distillers and go, oh, they don't make anything good. Um, you know, so that's why we really want to support and say, yeah, you know, you got to put out a good product. Uh, and it, if you can see, you want to come in and see how we're doing things, that's fine. I, I may not tell you a whole lot, 
but uh, you're, you're welcome to come in and walk around. So, so how's uh, bourbon tourism been in Virginia? Because like here it's exploded. Have you, have you guys seen that as well in Virginia? Well, for us, tourism is a little bit harder than it is. You know, a lot of people go to Kentucky and they, they go to Kentucky to go visit distilleries. Uh, for us, it's a little bit different. We have, you know, we're right in the middle of, I'll call it historic, you know, where people are coming to see, uh, you know, Civil War. You know, we're, we're, the distillery site is actually a, a site of a Civil War battle. Um, you know, there's a lot of historic sites as far as the Civil War, a lot of Revolutionary War. Um, you know, George Washington was actually lived, you know, uh, his boyhood home is literally across the river from the distillery. So a lot of people come for the history. And it's our our challenge is to get them to come in and visit the distillery. Now, I think the Virginia wine industry has done a, a great job of getting people to realize that there's wine in the state. Uh, and then, of course, breweries have, have been doing pretty well as well. Um, so it's been a struggle for us as, as far as getting the, the visitors here. But we still, you know, this last year, we saw almost 30,000 people come through the distillery. Uh, you know, obviously not the hundreds of thousands of people that people will go to larger distilleries, but we're hoping that we can grow that and let people know that, yeah, we're, we're a distillery that's been here for a long time and we plan to be here for another 85, 90 years at least. So you got to figure out a way to get yourself on the, the history trail over there. Right? Yeah. If, if the, Take if a the, break from if, the capitals and all the, yeah, you, <laughs> yeah. the north and come down and yeah, you, you, you go do the capital, you go across the river, you go <laughs> see George Washington's house you grew up in. Then, Oh, there's this old distiller over here. Oh, and we get to drink. Absolutely. Yeah. Count me. Yeah, in. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's our whole goal is how to get them getting, you know, you're like, Hey, yeah, that, that's, that's a really nice monument there, but come see a distillery. Have a drink. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. I mean, that's an easy sell point for me to come in. Just say, yeah, let's let's go, let's go do that. You know, you can you can go see a monument every single day if you wanted to. But so I guess um, you know, we're coming coming down here to the end of this, and I kind of want to get a little bit more information about really where do you kind of see is is there expansion? Is there is there ideas of like how how much more bigger can is, is gonna get um in regards of like what you all are trying to do uh in regards of growth or anything like that? Yeah, well, right now we're actually in the in the midst of an expansion. Um, you know, we're we're adding tanks. Uh, we've added just in the past, uh, probably I'm going to say about a month. We've added about eleven tanks to our production. Uh, we're hoping to add to our bottling line here per, pretty soon to be able to pick up production uh, because we really want to. You know, we're we're coming up. Some of the moves that we made a couple of years ago when I came in five, six years ago was to increase some of our small batch production and increase some of our John Jay and things like that. And, and uh, those, those are kind of coming into fruition now and we're hoping to expand and make more of that uh, bourbon available. And, but we, I don't think we ever really have any ideas. We, we don't want to become this huge multi-million case distillery. We want to be focused on making the absolute best products that we can, you know, the, the best bourbon that we can find or best bourbon that we can produce and, uh, you know, the best, best gins, best vodkas, best rums. We want to absolutely make great products. Uh, and if we grow to be, you know, a large, larger regional size, great. Um, but that's not really our focus. Our focus is to make a great product. And Sazerac supports that vision. They're not like, uh, <laughs> they're not like, yeah, that sounds great. But, uh, <laughs> we want to crank sure out as do. much juice as possible. I'm sure they Most do. Of the time. Yeah, no, absolutely. They they absolutely 100% support uh, making the best product that we can make. Very cool. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, and shout out to to Matthew, who was here on the chat. Uh, he just said, thanks for joining in, Brian. It was so, so great to actually learn about a brand that's flying under the radar uh, for a lot of the bourbon geeks out there. Because, like I said, for myself, you know, learning more about the mash bill and really how the operation kind of functions and, you know, knowing that your single barrels are nine to 14 years old, like that's, that's got some age on it for, yeah, for even, absolutely. I mean, for even most of the Sazerac portfolio, when you're looking at the, the Weller antiques, you're looking at six years old, maybe seven, something like that. So seeing of, of, of what's coming out of Virginia, uh, can't wait to go get my hands on some more of those bottles. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll be sending them your way. <laughs> you got it. I'm you're marking those barrels. Yeah, go your mark. Go your mark that barrel. I'll, I got my credit card. We're ready to start swiping. <laughs> okay. But Brian, thank you again for for coming on the show today. You know, giving us some more information about A. Smith Bowman, uh, the history, sort of your history, and how you kind of cut your teeth in the industry, and kind of your family life too. Uh, I think uh, I think it'd be fun to 
get your get your whole family on here one day and kind of see you all kind of like go back and forth if there's any of that. <laughs> it w- would definitely be interesting. I'll that. <laughs> so um, last way to kind of give a shout out. So if people want to know more about you or they want to visit the distillery, where do they go and do that? Uh, know more about us or visit the distillery, go ahead and go to uh, asmithbowman.com. That's the best way to find us uh, and any information about us. Uh, we're on Twitter and Instagram as well, but uh, you can get all that from the from the website. There you go. And ride the coattails on their Virginia mm-hmm. history trail and stop, stop over in. there. Yep. And uh, yeah, and then go and get yourself uh, a nice bottle of A. Smith Bowman to take over. John J. Bowman. I think I think that John J. at least fit my flavor profile. Absolutely. Well, you, and you never know. You can come in and, and, and try them all next time you're in the area. Okay. Sold. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So make sure everybody that you are, uh, you know, you check out their website, make sure you go to bourbonpursuit.com. We've got links on there for all the episodes that we've had. If you want to know more about any of the, the, uh, the Sazerac portfolio, you can kind of check out some of our past episodes we've done there too. If you want to follow us, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we're all over the place there. Um, yeah. And then also thank you to everybody that is a Patreon supporter that was joining us, watching this show live as it happened on YouTube. Just again, one of those perks of being able to watch this live before it actually goes out on air. So, Brian, go ahead and close it out. Yeah, for sure. Brian, thanks, man. That was uh, very Thank interesting you. and great. You know, like you said, the bourbon has been crazy growth, and we're kind of have blinders on. You know, we have these Kentucky brands, you know, things that we're used to, and like w- we focus on those, but then you forget that there's these guys like you all doing such great things, and like he's flying under the radar, and, uh, with the flavors you were talking about, like I think Kenny and I might run out and go get some bottles <laughs> after this. But, I just uh, want to find some more coconut. That's yeah. The coconut and the oak and all. Yeah. But uh, no, appreciate your time, man. It's a cool story. And uh, I want to come to your holiday party. So <laughs> we'll do these uh, booze wars. Me yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that, that, I'll, I'll put the invitation out next time. Cool. 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 <laughs> so uh, yeah, if anyone has any show suggestions, comments, feedback, uh, let us know. Um, we're always here to serve you guys, you know, bring the audio to you. So uh, we'll see you all next time. Cheers.